Good morning. It's been a long time since I've uh, kind of been referred to as Larry Sandler's son. That sounds really nice. It's also been a long time since I've been down to this campus, this far south. Uh, I remember the old building. Uh, it smelled like science to me. I came in a little bit late and I realized I didn't understand a damn word she was saying, so I guess it really is science. Uh, I'm very impressed with all of you, I can tell you that. I imagine a lot of you have had the experience of having dinner or lunch or maybe a cup of coffee with someone that you haven't seen in a very long time. You know that thing we call intimate strangers? It's kind of awkward. You know, you're happy, maybe you're sad to see them, maybe a little anxious, but you don't always know what to talk about. On the one hand, you knew them once intimately, so you could talk about such issues. On the other hand, it's been a long time, so you don't know exactly who they are and who you are with them, and what do you actually talk about? When I was asked to come and talk to you this morning about my dad, I found myself strangely in that situation with my own father. This has nothing to do with the love I have for my dad. Rather, it has to do with time, the big gap in time between his life ending and my life now. And so I'll be honest with you, I initially struggled with what am I going to tell you. I certainly wasn't going to talk about genetics. I don't really know anything about it. <laughs> However, I was preparing a class. As I just mentioned, I teach uh, psychology classes over at Olympic College in Bremerton. And the class was abnormal psychology. The topic was depression. And specifically, uh, a model of depression known as existential psychotherapy. That's a nice piece of psychobabble for you geneticists. But actually, in a nutshell, what it's about is how people struggle to find meaning in their lives. Meaning in great joy, meaning in suffering, and meaning in the everyday routine of life. And I was telling my students that sometimes, for some people who are depressed, some people, they get addicted to the really big things in life, the kinds of things that you, know, you and I will have from time to time. You know, we fall in love, graduate, get a job, maybe start a family, get a house. These things happen, and they're great, greatly joyous. But for some people, they get addicted to those things. And I was actually telling, since my students are so much younger, that in the social media age of ours, you can become very addicted to those things, like a three-ring circus where you're not only a voyeur, but an exhibitionist. You're in the circus and watching the circus. But here's the point. You then miss the beauty of everyday life, the richness of life, right? The joys of living in the routine of life. And that's when it hit me. That's how my dad lived. My dad lived very richly in the moments of life. I know if he were here, he would be really honored by what we're all doing. But those of you who knew my father, you know, right? You know he didn't live for this. He wasn't going for a Nobel Prize, wasn't going for Professor of the Year, wasn't looking to have a library named after him. His richness, his meaning in life, his fulfillment came from you, his students, his colleagues, his friends, his family, and just being present here at the University of Washington. And so what I thought I would do for you for just a few minutes, and I won't take much of your time, is I would share with you some, what I'm calling small sweet moments of his life that I experienced with him. Uh, a little bit sort of outside genetics, if you will. And then I'm going to tell you from that gap of time, all right, what have I gotten from my dad? How am I similar? How am I different? But most importantly, this way of living that my dad did, how it's impacted me. I've got four little examples. I've titled them. This first one I call iceberg lettuce and cottage cheese. <laughs> Those of you who remember my dad a long time ago, you know he struggled with his weight. In the last years of his life, he actually his weight was pretty good, and he was looking good. But prior to that, he really struggled with his weight. And this is one of his diets. I was at home eating with him. I was having a sandwich, and my dad had a large ball of iceberg lettuce. You know those basically tasteless balls of crap? <laughs> and low-fat cottage cheese, almost equally unpalatable. Salt, pepper, fork, knife, all on a paper plate, no less. And I'm watching my dad eat, and I remember thinking, 
Was I wrong about iceberg lettuce? <laughs> because he made it look so good. He made it look like it was a gourmet meal. Now granted, my dad would have rather had steak smothered in lamb, as he liked to say. <laughs> but diet or no diet, he was enjoying his food. He enjoyed all his food. He, was en he enjoyed breaking bread with pretty much anybody. Uh, anyway, that's my first example. And actually, as I think about it, regrettably, I don't possess that particular attribute. Uh, I'm a very dull eater, and I make it look boring. So didn't get that from him. This next example I call Green Lake with a Stick. As my dad uh, got healthier, he also started exercising. A lot of you know he swam down here at the dub regularly. But he also took walks around Green Lake, and occasionally I would accompany him. I would run around one side of the lake, and he would walk around the other. And I remember as our paths met up, I could see him walking. He did have this beautiful walking stick, and people complimented on him all the time. But also I could tell he was enjoying his newfound body, his new energy, just walking. He was enjoying watching the people, watching the ducks. It was, I didn't say it at the time, but upon reflection, it was like a Zen walk. He was very present in the walk. And we got back to the car to go home. All I really had done was worked out at Green Lake. My dad was like Buzz Aldrin coming back from the moon. You know, he was just very present in that walk, and he looked that way. This next example I call Dirty Harry Three. My dad and I would watch movies from time to time together. Sometimes we go out to the theater. Sometimes we watch at the, what was then the fledgling Showtime Network. But you know in either one, before the main feature comes on, there's like usually some kind of jingle. I can remember in the old days in the theater, the curtains would part, and there was this little with weird things going on. I don't know if you remember that, but I remember it vividly. And Showtime has its own Showtime Presents moment. But in either case, at that moment, my dad would wring his hands in enthusiasm and anticipation. And it didn't matter whether we were about to see like some landmark in cinematography or if it was another installment of Dirty Harry. My, my dad was a big fan of Clint Eastwood's character, Dirty Harry. So we watched them all together. But you know, my dad was that way with detective novels. He enjoyed great literature, but he enjoyed mysteries and a detective novel. And again, just those pleasures of life, the richness in life in that way. This last example I have for you is actually my favorite. It's nearest and dearest to me. And I call it Hiya, Jack. This happened many times when I was a teenager. I can remember when I was a teenager coming home in the evenings, maybe from seeing a friend or a rock concert, and ambling up the stairs of the house. Uh, my mom might be downstairs uh, watching TV, my dad upstairs maybe in bed reading. And when you go up the stairs of, my, of the house where I grew up, my parents' bedroom's off to the left. You can't actually see in it. But my dad knew his eye that was climbing up the stairs. And he would call out, Hiya, Jack. I know that doesn't sound like much to you, but it was a genuine, affectionate salutation. And you know, when I think about it, when my friends came over, he was equally engaging, as you said, liked to talk to people. And, and he meant it. And actually, when I think about it as well, when I went to my friend's father's house, I don't think they hardly grunted a word to either one of us. But my dad said that. And at the time, I guess I didn't really get it. But I think now it's almost as if my dad appreciated that his moments with his teenage son were ephemeral. And of course, sadly, neither he nor I knew just how ephemeral. I have lots and lots of examples. I'm keeping it to those four. I know you guys are ready for break. But when I think about the way my dad lived now, all these years later, I also think about how do I live? What have I gotten from my dad? And so just for a minute or two. Well, <clears throat> I did follow in his footsteps. Uh, I'm a teacher. But as I got very vividly clear to me as I came in listening to this talk, uh, my dad and most of you are true academics and scientists. Uh, I kind of think of myself as academic light. Uh, I really enjoy teaching, and I'm, a pretty, and I'm pretty good at it. But, and I'm, by the way, I'm also curious about many things like my dad, but I'm sort of like the PBS special kind of guy. That's about all I really need. Uh, all the rest of the stuff, I'm not like my dad in that way. But the teaching was a lot to me. My dad was a family man, uh, a loving husband and father, 
And he kept in close contact with his two sisters, his family of origin, and his father when his dad was alive. Uh, I'm not a family man. I was married once many years ago, briefly. I have no children. So in that regard, very different men. In terms of pastimes, well, as some of you already know, I was alluded to, my dad was sort of equally studious and academic outside of genetics as he was in genetics. Uh, he studied and learned many things. He and my mom were historians in genetics. Uh, but he studied lots of things. And as was mentioned, he also was really good at learning languages. He not only spoke Italian fluently, but Hebrew fluently, and lectured in both. And I remember at the time uh, of my dad's death, he actually was telling me he was planning to learn Greek. No doubt he would have succeeded in that, too. When I think of my pastimes, I'm retiring soon. And uh, other than watching maybe the occasional PBS special, uh, I plan to spend a lot of time on the beach. I'm moving out to the coast. Uh, a couple of beers, and listen to rock and roll music from the 1970s. That's kind of my pastime. <laughs> However, when I think about what my dad really gave to me, and when I think about the way he lived his life, this richness, this presence to the moments of life, these small, beautiful, sweet moments of life, I really can say it in one word. It's passion. Passion. I have that. I think I got that from my dad. I could have stood up here for 10 minutes and rattle off a bunch of my small, sweet moments. But it's not about me. It's about my dad. But the point I'm making is I live the same way. As I said, I'm retiring shortly. My colleagues are not going to do anything like this for me, I assure you. Um, I have no son that will ever speak of me. But I was thinking, hypothetically, hypothetically, if I did have a son, and he were speaking at some event much like this, I actually think he would say many of the same things about me that I'm saying about my dad, not so much in the content, but how I live my life, with this passion, with this richness in the moments of life, not the three-ring circus, but the daily parts of life. And that actually leads me to a very uplifting notion about my dad's life that I think about all these years later, I look at that picture of my dad, and it's very weird to be so much older than he looks like in that picture. But it made me think this. If you live life present, aware, in all these rich, sweet moments of life, the way my dad did, it really doesn't matter how long you have lived. You've lived a life of magnificence. And that's how I would describe my dad. He was magnificent. I want to thank all of you for honoring my father this way. But I also really want to thank you for taking a few moments of your time to uh, listen to me share a few small moments of his life. Thank you very much.